Okay, hello everyone, and this is Business 670, chapter number 11, dealing with corporate performance, governance, and business ethics. So let me share my screen. Okay, so what we want to talk about in this particular chapter is looking at and understanding what are the relationship between the stakeholder and management and corporate performance. Uh, maximizing return to the stockholders and who who are they what are some of the governance mechanisms and how are they used to align the interest of the stockholders and the managers why is it important to have these governance mechanisms what the main ethical issues and some of the unethical behaviors that in business today and what can be done to improve the ethical climate of organizations and to make sure that these businesses do not violate good ethical principle. Our opening case on page 359 is the Hewlett Packard case, looking at a, a software firm, pretty interesting case, and in a, a very good example of the themes that you're gonna be looking at in this particular chapter. Uh, the actions taken by the stakeholders, were they truly in the best interest of HP? Uh, those type things. So, was HB's behavior toward its stockholders and shareholders and investors unethical? So, it's really going to touch on a lot of these things we're going to talk about in this particular chapter. And in, and in this chapter, it's really about looking at uh, the governance mechanism that, show her, that shareholders uh, should implement to ensure that the managers act in the best interest of the company as they go about pursuing strategy that's gonna maximize shareholder value. And we have to pay attention to the other stakeholders as well within the organization, such as the employees, suppliers, customers, and what are some of the implications of these strategic decisions and how they need to be made to ensure strong ethical principles are applied. This is figure 11.1 .1 on page 362, which really goes into a discussion about the external and internal stakeholders and who they are. And a stakeholder really is any individual or groups of individuals with an interest a claim or stake in the company and how well it does, excuse me, how it does and equally important, how well it does it from an ethical standpoint. This may include the stockholders, creditors, employers, customers, people in the community, uh, the general public in general, and they typically divide up in these two groups, the external as well as internal um, stakeholders. And every one of these uh, are in this particular company to receive an exchange uh, within that company. And that may be from a financial standpoint, giving and taking or supplying goods and services and receiving payment for that. But it's all about a reciprocal relationship. Uh, say for an example, stockholders provide the risk capital that is needed in exchange for uh, management to maximize the return on their investment. Creditors and bondholders provide the company with capital in the form of debt, and they expect to be repaid on time and with interest. Employees provide labor and skills in exchange for expected compensation, income, wages, uh, benefits, job satisfaction, job security, good working condition, things of that nature. Um, cons customers provide the company with its revenues in exchange for high quality value added products that it, that it, they perceive the value of what they're paying for. Suppliers provide company with inputs in exchange for revenues. A government provide company with rules and regulations in, in return they expect to receive their corporate tax as well as uh, businesses that operated in a fair practice following fair competition rules and following the governmental rules. Unions help provide a company with productive employees in exchange the employees want benefits for their members or the unions want benefits for their members that is proportioned to the contributions to their company. Local communities provide 
companies with local infrastructure in exchange for what they want the company to be responsible uh, community neighbors in their communities. And the general public also provides with the national infrastructure to change from, from assurance that the quality of life that be improved as a result of the company's existence. So all of these claims come into account when a, a managers and leaders of the organization has got to go about formulating the strategies or else the stockholders, excuse me, the stakeholders may withdraw their support. Over on page 363, a stakeholder impact analysis really is about how do we go about satisfying the claims of all stakeholders. And as like everything else, companies got to make choices as to what's going to be the best way to, to do that, who's going to be given the highest priority in their strategies to satisfy their needs. And we know that stakeholders certainly uh, have a significant impact that we just saw a while ago. Uh, with reference to what that exchange looks like. So the typical stakeholder, uh, when you're doing an impact analysis, you typically will follow a few steps. Uh, one of those steps is going to be, who are they? How do we go about identifying who they are? What are their interests and their concerns? What claims are they likely to make against the organizations? And what are the most important from the organization's perspective, those claims? And how do we go about identifying and correcting as well as implementing the strategic challenges? Uh, most companies have gone through this process quickly and come to the conclusion that there's may be just um, several strategic or several st stakeholder groups that must be satisfied above all others and if it is going to survive and prosper and those groups typically are the customers the employees and the stockholders so let's look at the um, the stockholders just for a moment uh, we know that the company's stockholders are uh, from a, are a little bit different from the stakeholder groups. Stockholders are the legal owners of the organization and they provide risk capital. Now the stockholders don't have a, um, a business decision making capability on the day to day operations of the organization, but they do provide risk capital to that organization, which is a major source of capital that allows that company to operate in its business. And the capital that the stockholders provide to a company is seen as risk because there's no guarantee that the stakeholders, excuse me, the stockholders will get any return of their investment. And what they want is they want good dividends. They want a good rate of return. They expect those rate of returns and they're looking for that to be consistent. Uh, over the past decade, maximizing returns of stockholders has taken on a significant importance as the uh, number of employees have become stockholders in the companies through their employees, stock ownership plans, ESOPs. And we know that when a company misses its target earnings for a quarter or for the year, how their stock will respond by the financial analyst on Wall Street. So it's really important that they meet the needs of the stockholders. Uh, the stakeholder claims profitability, profit growth is a part of that as well as the manager's got to be pursuing strategies that's going to maximize the returns that the stockholders receive from holding their shares in the company. And the stockholders typically will receive that in the form of dividend payments or capital appreciation in the market value of their stock. So their stock goes up as well as they get a good rate of return of their dividends and that stock appreciation really is a way for which the manager generates the funds that they need to provide future dividend payments and keep the prices up where it's a long-term measurement of performance, return on invested capital in a way to grow profits for the company over time. Return on investment capital is a way in which companies measure profitability of a, of a particular company, and it really tells managers how efficiently they are using the capital resources that they've been entrusted uh, to generate more profits. And to grow profits, companies typically will do a couple of things. One of those is participating in the market that is growing, i.e. finding 
uh, that new industry, that new market that has growth potential, taking the market share from competitors uh, by expanding their market, either through product differentiation and or through economies of scales to uh, lower pricing, consolidate the uh, industry through horizontal integration and developing new markets through international expansion, either through vertical integration or and or vertical integration or differentiation. And the, the, the task that these managers have before them is try to find that right balance between profitability and profit growth. Too much emphasis on profitability at the expense of future profitability and profit growth can make the enterprise less attractive to stakeholders as too much emphasis is placed on the short term and not thinking long term that's going to maximize for the long term of the organization. And we're looking at maximizing returns to the stockholders that's going to boost a company's profitability and profit growth rate that is consistent with the claims of what's going on with other key stakeholder groups. Let's say for an example that the company is profitable and its profits are continuing to grow. They can pay higher salaries to the other group called employees. They can also afford better benefits, maybe such as health care uh, coverage, which helps satisfy the needs of all of the employees. So stakeholder management requires consideration of how that firm goes about practicing that cooperation for stakeholders, not only in the short term through building the uh, trust and knowledge, but also in the long run for profitability and profit growth, which will hopefully ensure the best interest for all the stakeholders. Um, not all stake holder groups want the company to maximize long-term profit groups say for instance suppliers are more comfortable about selling the goods because they want to be assured that they the company will have the funds needed to pay them for their products similar uh, customers are willing to purchase for more profitable companies because they can assure that those companies will be around in the long term. So it, it, it's like a contradictory of terms where you've got to satisfy both groups where you want to maximize profit growth so that you can grow the company, pay your employees better, invest in infrastructure to maintain, the, to grow the company through expansion. But you also want to not take your eyes off of uh, profitability from the standpoint that you're not able to pay your bills and your customers are being able to get a good high quality product at a reasonable price so it's a it's a real fine balance between the two and equally important if any one of those gets out of balance with society norms today uh, you have to consider that as well that the law the governance that is set by the federal and state local governments as well as societal expectations to ensure that as much as we want companies to be profitable, we don't want them to be profitable at the risk of causing harm or damage to a community, to its customers, violating uh, governmental rules and regulations. We, we really want them, in short, to make a profit but do it ethically that benefits society and not just the rock star CEOs, I guess, if I could use that. On page 366, another good example of Stuckabees and Christie's upon auction houses and what they got involved into into illegal price fixing, which led to higher commissioners paid by the sellers. Uh, which really, really hurt that company as they uh, were acting unethically, but equally important, they were acting illegally. So another good, good read to reinforce these concepts. Uh, agency theory looks at the problem that may arise over on page 367 in a business relationship when one or more persons excuse me, when one person delegates decision-making authority to another, and it certainly could be a way to understand why managers may not act in the best interest of the stakeholders and why that sometimes they behave unethically as well as illegally, which again, you will see that in that case, strategy and action on page 366. So this agency theory really deals with uh, that decision-making authority and uh, that decision-making person who's doing that 
uh, how that decision is being made, what type of problem that may arise from that, if the agents as well as the principals have different goals, and if the agents take actions that are not in the best interest of the principals, what will occur? Agents may be able to do this, may be able to do this simply from the reason that informational uh, asymmetry between the principal and the agents that uh, when one has more information uh, than the other, and as a result of that, they're making decisions uh, that may not be in the best interest. So this information having more is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can make it difficult for principals to measure how well the agent is performing and thus hold that agent accountable using the entrusted resources. Now, principals got to also put mechanisms in place with the purpose of monitoring the agents, evaluating their performance, and equally important, if necessary, taking the appropriate corrective actions. And in some cases, those actions may lead up to and including uh, removal from those particular uh, uh, pop, from those particular levels of authority within an organization, like firing or um, you know those type things. So when you think about the informational symmetry, is when one agent has more information above that that the, that the principal has. Some of the laws for monitoring the agents we see here. Um, the, the co-determination law, security exchange commissions, and the generally accepted accounting principles. All of those are developed today so that any, any company can be monitored and evaluated to make sure that they're doing the right thing uh, to uh, protect all the stakeholders while making a reasonable rate of return without doing any undue damage, anything illegal or unethical uh, to the stakeholders as well as the stockholders. On the job consumption uh, was another um, phenomenon over on page 369 where it could be determined that the CEOs along with some of the other senior management, that they're trying to satisfy their own desires for greater income by using their influence to override the board of directors to persuade compensation committees to grant pay and credit, to, to grant pay increases. Uh, you may also see this, what is called empire building or rock star CEOs who really get exorbitant um, compensation packages and their performance of the company does not really align with what is being paid to those particular levels of the organization. Uh, and some of the critics of the industry today claim that such extraordinary pay has now become an endemic problem and that senior managers are really enriching themselves at the expense of stockholders and other employees. And what really, um, really drives this point home, which is really um, uh, almost to the height of a um, revolt by the stockholders, is that the size of some of the uh, CEO pay packages in there uh, that is not directly aligned to the overall comp company performance or in some cases they drive the company in the dirt and take their golden parachute and leave and if you uh, one of the classic examples from the 2000s was the Enron scandal uh, Ken Lay and uh, Ken Schilling very interesting read about how the corporate governments didn't do their due diligence and how they, how they really hurt that um, utilities industry. But very interesting read. So really it's about looking at the long-term profitability against the growth of the revenues and ensuring that a CEO and the um, directors of the organization really are uh, awarded appropriately. Uh, and this is just that trade-off between profitability and long-term growth rates over on page 370. Some of the uh, problems associated with this um, agency problem really came about in the 2000s when there was a series of scandals that swept through the corporate world 
which really attributed to, to a lot of self-interest seeking senior executives and failed government, or excuse me, scale, failed governance mechanisms that hold or excuse me, that did not hold these CEOs accountable. Again, I'll come back to the Enron scandal. You're probably be very familiar with that. And I remember seeing a video where the employees were walking out at, uh, at the, uh, their work that day from that building, holding a box of everything that they uh, accumulated from that company. That's all they got because the company imploded. At the same time, Ken Schilling and Ken Lay was cooking the books and saying, oh, we're a great company, profitability, things looking good. And two weeks later, they had imploded. So very interesting read. And as a result of that scandal, we had the Sarbanes Oxley Act from 2002, which is a direct result of that. And you will see that uh, later in this chapter as well. So agency problem, good board of governance, ethical behavior is certainly paramount in today's businesses. So some of the challenges for principals confronted with the agency problems is really looking at shaping the behaviors of the agent so that they act in accordance with the goals that are set by the principals. Uh, reduce the information symmetry against between agents and principals so that both of them have the same amount of information or in other words one doesn't know what the other one doesn't know and they're not and they're using that to their own advantage instead of the advantage or the organization and developing mechanisms for removing agents who do not um, respond appropriately with the best interest of the stakeholders and stockholders in the organizations. Uh, one way they go about doing that again is through a good government governance, good good board of directors, and good controls associated with that. And governance mechanisms over on page 372 is what uh, the principals put in place to align incentives between. Uh, them and the agents and to monitor and control the agents to ensure that the scope and the frequency of the agency problem is not out of hand. It is reduced. It, and again, it's all about they're acting in a way that's going to be consistent with the best interest of the principles. And the four main types of governance for aligning stockholder and management interest are the board of directors, it's the stock based compensation, financial statements, and the takeover constraint. So let's look at a few of those very quickly. The board of directors really is the centerpiece. It's the board of directors who are uh, elected by the stockholders and under corporate law, they represent the stockholders' interests for the company. They can be held legally accountable for the company's actions. They're the apex of the decision-making within the company that allows us to monitor its corporate strategic decisions that should be, again, inconsistent with the stockholders' interest. And in addition, they have the legal authority to hire, fire, and compensate corporate employees, including uh, the uh, CEO of the organization. The board is also responsible for making sure that the financial statements of the company presented are a true picture of its financial situation. SAR Bangs Oxley Act of 2002 really, really added some um, legal leverage behind financial statements. And when a CEO and a chief uh, operating officer and chief financial officer signs their name now. I mean, it, it really, really means that they are attesting to that the finances of the company are true and accurate. And uh, several of the big um, accounting firms are no longer in business as a result of going, uh, working with the management team of Sarbanes Oxley and in essence cooking the books back in the 2000 time frame. And again, study that and you will see, uh, you will get those names of those particular companies. I think one of them was uh, Price Waterhouse was one of them. It's no longer in business as far as that pers perspective is. So the typical board of directors are typically include inside and outside directors. Inside are typically management team, senior management of the company. Outside directors are just that. Uh, typically full-time professionals who's hired to be part of the company who are part of other boards as well. 
but they're not direct employees, but they do have that governance responsibility to do that. Some critics of the inside um, directors indicate that sometimes the inside directors dominate the outside directors because the inside directors have more working knowledge, more intimate knowledge of what's going on, and that uh, if not very careful, they can dominate the uh, outsider, but we have to take a step back and recognize that the entire concept of the board of directors is to provide that level of oversight to ensure that a single individual or the senior executives of the company are acting legally and ethically to provide uh, tangible benefit for all stakeholders of an organization and not just themselves. And again, the 2002 Thor Sarbanes Oxley Act is a direct result of, of the Enron scandal that occurred in 2000. Another one of the things we talked about was stock-based compensation. Uh, one of the, and it's kind of being used to reduce the scope of the agency problem by the principles to establish incentives for performance. Uh, in essence, they are determining some uh, predetermined stock price that that executive can purchase that stock down the road based on the performance of the organization and giving the manager stock options is a right again for them to purchase shares at a predetermined price somewhere down toward the grant date and again uh, based on performance of the organization. It's really designed to motivate the managers of the organization to adopt those strategies. Again, it's going to be in the best interest. And it's really driven to align the management and stockholders' interests. Uh, but I guess we could, uh, we could find classic examples, not only from 2000, but even today, where uh, this prob, prob, excuse me, probably didn't work out as good as it was designed. Uh, from a variety of reasons why it did not. So this is still something that's out there. That is still something that the governance so uh, you got to be looking at to ensure that that company is doing the right things. Another one is uh, financial statements and auditors on page 374, 375, especially when you have publicly traded companies that are being controlled by the Securities and Exchange Commission that are preparing uh, their financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting practices. And all this is driven to ensure that they're given consistent, detailed, and accurate information about how efficiently and effectively that the principal agents uh, are for the stockholders uh, and, and how the managers are running the company. And But because, again, I'll come back to the 2002 sarbanes Oxley Act it really gave the SEC some legal, more legal authority to now to really go after those organizations who are not doing that. And it really set up a new oversight board for accounting firms, and it requires the CEOs and CFOs, which we already indicated, to endorse their company's financial statements and barred companies from hiring the same accounting firm from auditing and consulting services. Again, trying to find that mechanism to which as stockholders and as stakeholders, our interests are being met as well. Uh, takeover constraint, I believe, was the last one. And this is where uh, stockholders do have some residual power. I mean, they can sell their shares and if stock holders sell in large numbers, the price of the shares will decline. If the price of the shares fall enough, the company might be worth less on stock market than the actual value of its assets. And at this uh, particular point, the company may become an attractive acquisition target uh, that, and they run the risk of being purchased by another enterprise against the, in some cases, the wishes of the management team. And that risk of being acquired by, by another company is known as a takeover constraint. Excuse me. And it limits the extent to which a manager can pursue strategies and take actions that put their own interests above those of the stockholders. Corporate Raiders was a term that got that really came about in the 80s and 90s, where there was a lot of, of um, poor management, poor board of directors, 
poor governance mechanisms that really was running a corporation that really were doing things illegally and unethically and that uh, in some cases the stocks were being underperformed so corporate raiders came about that was going to purchase the stock in the company in such big blocks to either take over the business and run it more efficiently by ousting out the senior leadership team or and replacing it with a team that uh, hopefully would would align more with the stockholders to maximize their returns than everyone else uh, or they may in some cases do a takeover bid where they would just actually take over the company did not best the company and sell off some of its assets uh, green mail was a source that was gained um, excuse me this takeover bid this takeover constraints even though they may not be successful in doing that, they still were making uh, a lot of money by um, defending that company at a healthy premium. And as a result of that, this, this term about green mail came about, which was um, looking at how the hostile takeover bids um, impacted that company and the price that it was going to jack up that that stock to a premium price, which it would exceed what they had in assets, again, as a way to do a shakeup and either take it over or in order to make money. Uh, not as prevalent today as it was back in the third, excuse me, in the uh, 90s. Uh, and again, the Sarbanes Oxley Act makes that a little more difficult today. However, like everything else, there's a life cycle in industries, there's a life cycle in this as well. And it seems at times that uh, any company, if it's not very careful, can find itself, especially if it has high leverage of debt uh, in equity, if it's highly leveraged uh, more debt, then it potentially has become a potential for a takeover constraint. Okay. So let's talk about governance mechanisms inside a company and what that, that what does that look like? And it's really about that relationship as the agency problem can arise, can arise between different levels of the management within that company. It can be reduced within a company by using complementary government mechanisms that's gonna align hopefully the incentives and behaviors of employees with those of the upper level management. Uh, through good controls and feedback as well as incentive programs. So let's talk about these strategic control systems first, which is the primary governance mechanism that was established to reduce the scope of the agency problem between the levels of management through target setting, measurement, feedback that allows managers to be evaluated, uh, whether their strategies is really maximizing long-term profitability, and if, whether that company is really achieving superior performance, quality, and innovation, and customer responsiveness to ensure that it becomes profitable in the long term. The purpose of the strategic control system is to establish standards and targets which their performance can be measured, create systems measuring and monitoring performance on a regular basis, compare actual to against established targets and evaluating those results and making the necessary corrective actions when and if necessary. Uh, one of the versions of the way of uh, using a balanced scorecard certainly over in figure 11.3 I think we have here on page 377 really is a way in which uh, organization mission goals and strategic initiatives uh, can establish a set of criteria for assessing the performance in multiple perspectives, financial, consumer, internal perspective. And then this is just an example of a balanced scorecard to which one can look at to ensure that this corporate governance is doing what it should be doing to maintain the long-term profitability of the company. Another one is through uh, employee incentives, which control systems alone may not be sufficient uh, so that we can use incentives between stockholders, senior management, and the rest of the organizations. Uh, the best way to do this is certainly to help motivate employees and again, new um, New Core is a great example 
of how this is working of employee incentives as well as long-term profitability, not only from a local plant, but from the overall organizational perspective as employees are motivated to work toward goals that are centralized to maximizing the long-term profitability of the organization. Employee stock ownership plans is certainly one of those incentives at the end of the year based on financial performance of the organization is another one uh, that in, with employee compensation is tied, a piece of their employee compensation is tied to the goals that are linked to the uh, overall performance of the organization. Ethics and strategy, ethics, business ethics and ethical dilemmas. We'll end this, this particular chapter on this topic. And really, uh, ethics refers to the accepted principles of right or wrong that govern the conduct of a person, the members of a profession, or the action of an organization. And then business ethics are those accepted principles of right or wrong that governing the contact of people, just like you and I, within the working community, regardless of the, of the business that you're in. But let me take a step back and say, we're talking about business for profit. This applies to any nonprofit, any faith-based organization, anything that deals with uh, customers, consumers, whether it's nonprofit or for profit, all this information applies. Uh, at any given point in time, managers may be confronted with ethical dilemmas, which are situations that in some cases, it's not cut and dry, there's no except the principles of right or wrong, there may not be good available alternatives that seems ethically acceptable. The alternatives both could be uh, equally uh, unethical, but there's just no acceptable principles. And in our society today, uh, many accepted principles, as you know, of right and wrong are not universally recognized, uh, but in some cases they are uh, into law and some of those that should be or probably not into law. So the, really the goal of managers in the business community should be, be about pursuing strategies that again maximize the long-term profitability and profit growth of the enterprise or the organization while boosting returns for stockholders. And they've got to be consistent with the laws that govern the business behaviors societal norms that society accepts, as well as the internal um, rules and regulations set forth by the organization. Okay, ethical issues within the organization. Uh, that certainly comes from many different avenues. Uh, they're due to potential conflict between the goals of the organization, the goals of individual managers, the fundamental rights of important stakeholders. And st stakeholders do have the basic right to be respected and it's unethical to violate those rights in any way, shape, form, or fashion. As you know, uh, those who, who take the stakeholder view of business ethics are oftentimes often argue that it is enlightening self-interest of managers to behave in an ethical manager, ethical manager, excuse me. Some of those who take the stakeholder view of business ethics often argue that it is the enlightened self-interest of managers to behave in an ethical manner that recognizes the rights and responsibilities of all stakeholders. Doing so ensures that the ultimate benefit is for everyone and not any one particular individual. Some of this unethical behavior arises in the corporate settings when managers may decide to put the attainment of their own personal goals or the goals of the enterprise above the fundamental rights of one or more of the stakeholder groups. So everyone has a fundamental right, certainly those stakeholders. And it is the, the nominalist obligate responsibility that every person born has that right. 
Now let's look at the right of stakeholders over on page 381. Uh, stakeholders, stockholders, customers, employees, again, are some of those examples who are stakeholders within the organization. And it really is about their responsibility as stakeholders and the responsibility of the governance mechanisms as, uh, and how that's implemented to ensure the rights of all these different stakeholders are adhered to. The unethical behavior that may arise from the agency problem deals in these four or these arenas here of self-dealing, information manipulation, anti-competitive behavior, entrepreneurial ex exploitation, uh, substandard working conditions, environmental deregulation, and corruption. All of these are the things that uh, Board of Governance at times will have to deal with. Self-dealing is when managers use company funds for their own personal consumption. Bernie Evers of the, of the WorldCom, probably the classic example of the birthday party that he gave his wife, if I remember correctly. Again, back in that same time when the Enron was going on. Uh, information manipulation, where that uh, managers are controlling the corporate data, where they're distorting or hiding that information. Anti-competitive behavior, monopoly, entrepreneurial export exportation, uh, they're looking at rewriting the terms of contracts of buyers in a way that is more favorable to the firm, more so than to the original agreements of the contract. Uh, working conditions, pretty self-explanatory, certainly uh, impacts employee behavior and morale, it damages the environment, and corruption, where management paying bribes, which as we know that in this country is absolutely illegal. So what are some of the roots of unethical behavior? It really begins from personal ethics. You as the individual, I mean, bringing someone into the organization who is unethical and thinking that just because I have an ethics policy and procedure, now they're just going to become ethical, probably are not going to occur. So. Uh, hiring managers, doing their due diligence, doing their background checks, asking the right questions to ensure that they are hiring people who bring into the workplace a high value or place high value on personal ethics. A lot of studies of unethical behavior in the business setting have uh, come to several conclusions. conclusions. One of those is that they may not recognize what unethical behavior is. Um, they may not even recognize, or the organization itself may not even have any ethical or uh, policies or procedures related to that. The goals of the organization from the top management places more emphasis on performance than it does uh, ethical behavior, and certainly, again, uh, leadership from the senior level of the organization all the way down. So some of the roots of the unethical behavior is where this comes from. But I think the primary one for me is that that feeds into all of this is personal ethics. I mean, you got to come into the workplace, you as the individual, got to come into the workplace of doing what's right and wrong, always taking the high road regardless. Uh, how do we go about, how, doing this ethically, here you go, I jumped ahead of myself, where you're hiring people, you're hiring the right people that uh, who through your due diligence is going to act ethically and uh, do the right thing in all situations. Certainly a lot of organizations now have ethical training, they have ethical officers, they have ethical policies and procedures. They require us to get formal training each and every year in some cases and even indicate that, uh, that we reviewed off on our ethical policies and procedures uh, to ensure that they recognize that uh, we are now trained, we have bought into, we understand the ethics of the organization. Certainly leadership is paramount as well because it's the leaders who are not only going to not only going to talk about it, but they're going to have to walk the talk, in other words, preach it. 
and teach it and preach it and then live it out. I mean, in essence, that's where it really starts. And who's the leader of the organization? Every one of us in an organization is a leader. If you have a code of ethics and if you have a formal policy and procedures and you read that formal policy and procedures, then it probably won't cover everything humanly possible. So when those unethical situations comes up that's unclear, when it makes you feel uncomfortable, go ask the question. Get someone else involved. If you have a, uh, some companies I know have an anonymous tip line where you can make, um, um, uh, if you identify something unethical and you're unwilling to, excuse me, bring that up before your management team, then you can do a tip anonymously. So that's another way in which to do it. The one thing that you don't want to do as a leader of an organization is to create a chilling environment where when someone has an ethical issue or a safety issue, uh, that you blow it off, uh, that you uh, squelch it, that you don't take time to listen to it and you don't act upon it or you retaliate. That's the absolute worst thing you could do. And certainly is not only unethical, but illegal by you as a member of management, but could bring uh, legal implications to the organization and you personally. So act, acting ethically is absolutely paramount and needed in today's organizations. So with that, that concludes uh, this chapter. And again, thank you so much for listening.